You're listening to a message preached from the pulpit of the Bible Baptist Church, St. Thomas, Ontario. Matthew chapter 5. The greatest message ever preached by the greatest preacher who ever lived. That's what Matthew, some have called the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapter 5 through 7. The greatest message ever preached by the greatest preacher who ever lived. Jesus Christ himself uh, giving us this message. Matthew chapter 5 through 7. It's called the Sermon on the Mount. And when you hear the word sermon, for us, what connotation comes to your mind? If you hear the word sermon, something that is uh, loud usually, maybe boring, depending on what background you are, are from. But we call it the Sermon on the Mount. And really, if you uh, look at this, it's not at all like that at all. In fact, uh, Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 and 2 kind of sets the scene. And it says that uh, the multitudes were gathered, and he went up into a mountain. And when he was set, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying. So if you picture that, he's with a bunch of people, and he goes up in the mountain, and his disciples come. And the Bible says when he was set, and that kind of the idea of, of just, you know, maybe sitting down on a rock, or maybe just sitting with the guys there, and, and his closest disciples disciples there, and he taught them, he opened his mouth and taught them, saying. And so it wasn't that he was preaching at them, he was talking to them, he was giving them instruction, he was telling them uh, about uh, original Christianity, what is it going to be like to be a Christian? What, what connotation comes to your mind when I say the word Christian? Probably the first thing that comes to mind is a follower of Christ, someone who tries to follow the teachings of Christ. If you are an unsaved person, that you're at your work and you use the word Christian, what would come to their mind? What would connotation would come to their mind? I don't know, but I know this. The, here we're talking about Jesus Christ telling people who are following him what it's going to be like to be a follower of his. And the word Christian is not going to be used for several years. The Bible says that they are called Christians first in Antioch. So that's several years later. So that even the term Christian is not going to be used for a while. So here in Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7, in this message given by Jesus Christ, we find him telling those who are already following him a little bit what it's going to be like to be a true follower. And so I understand, and we understand, we believe that things have not changed in 2,000 years. Although culture has changed and though uh, economy has changed and you know uh, all the gadgets and, and gizmos that we have has changed, Christianity, being a follower of Christ, hasn't changed. You should look at Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7 and live Matthew 5, 6, and 7 just like James and John and all the other disciples. These, these truths are timeless. This is Jesus Christ giving you the instruction of what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. In Matthew chapter 4, at the end, he's calling his disciples and he says to them, he goes by, there's four disciples mentioned there, James and John, Peter and Andrew, and they're fishing, and he says, follow Follow me, I'll make you fishers of men. And they dropped their nets and followed him. Can you imagine that? They dropped everything. They dropped their livelihood to follow a man who they didn't know to do whatever he told them to do. All his instruction was, was to follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Well, now, if you picture Jesus Christ sitting around with James and John and, and Peter and Andrew and the rest of the and other disciples are following, and he's sitting down and now he's filling in the gap of that. What does it mean to be, I said, follow me, now here's what that's going to mean. Here's what it's really going to mean to be a follower of Jesus Christ. This is what it means tomorrow when you go to your family gathering, what it means to be a follower of Christ. This is what it means on Tuesday when you go back to work to be a follower of Christ. For those of you who are retired, this is what it means when you sleep in half the day and go to Tim Hortons and then go to Tim Hortons and then go to Tim Hortons and then go back to sleep at night. If that's what you do, this is what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Whatever you do, this is what it means. This is, this is true, original Christianity from the mouth of the originator of Christianity, Jesus Christ himself. And so, I mean, sometimes... For a little secret, sometimes preachers steal messages from other preachers. I'm trying to steal a message here from Jesus Christ. What I'm trying to do, this is his message I'm going to try to give to you. And um, I've done it over three different times. And so when you preach every so often in the church, my series kind of are series in my mind, not in your mind. So last time I preached, I preached a message on the Sermon on the Mount. You probably don't remember that, but I do. And then next Sunday, I think I'm preaching again, so I'll finish it up. So we're talking about this original or authentic Christianity. Christianity uh, that Jesus Christ explains here in Matthew chapters 5 through 7. Of course, we're not going to read all that, but I'm looking at kind of what I believe is the, the kind of the, uh, the center of the whole thought of Jesus Christ and explain things from there. So look at Matthew chapter 5, and we'll start in verse number 17. 
Christ says to his disciples, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. He's the he's new guy on the scene. I mean, he, he, he just kind of burst on the scene with John the Baptist and the baptism. And, and this is relatively new in his ministry. And he said, my mission here is not to destroy the law, but to fulfill the law. The law and the prophets, all right? So he's not come. The word destroy there means to water down or to, to loosen, to make of none effect. He said, I'm not here to do that. I'm here to fill in the gaps. The law was good for a time, but it's not good enough for what God wants for us. And so I'm here to fulfill all the law and fill in the gaps and, and bring you to a, an original uh, and a real relationship with your God through my death. He doesn't say all that, but that's what he's saying. He said, I'm here to fulfill the law and the prophets. Look at verse number 18. For I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. He's talking here, you'll see this over and over in this message, about a kingdom. It's a new kingdom. It's not, it's not Rome versus the Jews. It's not that kind of kingdom. This is the, the kingdom of heaven, uh, the kingdom of God. It's a, it's a spiritual kingdom. He says, if you want to be great in the spiritual kingdom, obey the law. The law is good for those things. Look at verse number 20. For I say unto you, that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. And just to go back to several months ago, the Pharisees, in their mind, you can't think like you, because listen, if I say the word Pharisee, what word or word words come to your mind? Hypocrite. That's like, that's like, immediately, that's what I would think of. That's what you think. You know why? Because you've been brought up in church. All right? These men were not brought up. These men were fishermen uh, living in their community, doing their thing, uh, following the law. The Pharisees were the religious leaders of the day. And, and though they were, there may be some hypocrisy involved in, in some of those things, as a general rule, the Pharisees were not looked at as a bad. They were, they were respected. And we look at it and say, oh, Pharisee. They would say, oh, the Pharisees. And, and Christ just blew their minds and said, you want to get to heaven? You want to be part of the kingdom of heaven, your righteousness has to exceed the Pharisees. Huh. Well, we can't do that. Uh, we can't keep up with the Pharisees. I mean, I've got to provide for my family. i got to work in a fish. I, I'm surrounded by guys who are, you know, they're swearing and cussing all the time. And, and man, it's, it's a rough job. This is the real world. I don't live that life of the Pharisee. And now i got to do better than they to make it to heaven. Wow, this is, this is tough. And he blows their mind with that. We understand now looking back, he's not saying that you've got to be better than that. He's saying it's impossible. You cannot be good enough. You cannot be righteous enough to enter the kingdom of heaven. It's all about his righteousness. And I'll explain that later on as he goes through his life and dies on the cross. We understand that. When we're looking back, they're listening for the very first time for him to say, your righteousness has to exceed the righteousness of the Pharisees. In this message, Jesus Christ begins to, begins to pull back the curtain on the Pharisees a little bit. We know later on in his one of the best messages he ever preached was, you scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. We love that message, right? I mean, he just rips them out and, and points them out and says exactly what they are and points them out. And, and one of the, probably the harshest message that Jesus ever preached was a message to the hypocritical religious crowd. It wasn't to the sinner. It wasn't to the lady taken in adultery, for sure. It wasn't her. The harshest message you ever preached was to those who pretended to be religious and were not. People who sit in, who sat in synagogues. We sit in churches, so maybe a little different, but the same. Sometimes, if Jesus Christ were to, I'm trying to say, if Jesus Christ were to come here and were to sit here and talk to us, would he, would he be like this? Like he was his disciple and said, hey, I want to tell you what it's like to be a follower of me. Or would he be saying, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. Because he sees the heart and not just the outward appearance. And so, we talked last week that to be an original Christian or authentic Christian, it's like a road, all right? There's a, a middle road and there's a ditch on each side. The one ditch we looked at last week, uh, last time I preached, was the dip, ditch of hypocrisy, like exalting the law. All right, so think about the law as everything. It's all about rules and restrictions and, and all these things. And, and as long as you do this list of five things, then you're a good Christian. And it's all about do, do, do. And we said true Christianity is, is uh, not performance-based, it's relationship-based. It's all about knowing Jesus Christ in a real, real 
way. And from that real relationship, your actions flow out of that. The hypocrites were all about do, 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 do. And if you don't do, your disciples are eating with unwashed hands. And your disciples don't do this. And your disciples don't do that. And they're criticizing and critical. Another spirit of a, of a hypocrite is critical of everybody else. And, oh, yeah, our church is better than that church. And we have higher standards than they have. It's all about standards. And that was the ditch of hypocrisy or the law as characterized by the Pharisees. So tonight, I'm going to look at the, the ditch on the opposite side. And I'll be honest with you, working with teenagers for 25 years, I've seen this over and over again, and it bothers me. Sometimes in our churches, and I put myself in this because I'm part of the church and the preaching, if we overemphasize sometimes the do's and don'ts of the Christian life and don't emphasize the relationship, our young people grow up and they get to the point where they think that's, and, and they see the hypocrisy in our lives and they dive off the road and they go to the opposite extreme. Say, I don't want that, and so I'm going to do whatever I want to do. And I'm going to live a life whatever I want to do. And they go off from the ditch of hypocrisy, and they go flying across the genuine road of a Christian life to the other side of a worldly lifestyle. Avoiding worldliness is what we're going to talk about today. Worldliness. And if we talked about this as being hypocrisy in the law, over here we have worldliness and license. The opposite of law is license. When I was uh, a teenager, I went to the driver's office and I got my driver's license, right? Big day for every guy, every girl, to get their license. You have permission now to drive. License means permission. I went fishing with a couple of guys uh, a while back and I had to go get my fishing license to give me permission to catch fish. And I caught the only fish on the trip. It's about that big. <laughs> that was it. And uh, so I had to have that license to go catch that fish. $30 to catch that fish. What a ripoff, all right? My wife doesn't even know that. $30 out of the pocket for that fish. So I kept it. We skinned it. We ate it. <laughs> no, threw it back. All right, so have a license, right? So sometimes we get to the point where like we get, I'm not doing that. I'm going to do whatever I want. I I'm free in Christ. I can do whatever I want. I can live whatever lifestyle I want. And there's a lot of Christianity today that lives lives here in a, in a worldly mindset and a worldly lifestyle, a lifestyle of license. Do whatever you want. Hey, I still love Jesus, so I can do whatever I want. And I've seen young people go from here in a very strict upbringing, and for some reason, they veer off and they go, I'm just going to go do whatever I want. Uh, it, it bothers me, and, and, and I'm not saying it's all our fault. I'm just saying we got to be careful to teach our young people about a relationship with God, that, that there is a true path of Christianity, and it's not all about do's and don'ts. It's about a relationship with Almighty God through Jesus Christ. So this ditch over here of license. I want you to understand that here, as Jesus begins this message, the requirements of this original Christianity, of this Christianity, this lifestyle he's talking about, is not only what the law says, but he kind of ups the game a little bit. Look in your Bible here as we continue just quickly through a couple of verses. I'm going to show you a few things. Look at verse 21 of chapter 5. You'll see this is a pattern we're going to see here several times. Ye have heard that it has been said of them of old time, Thou shalt not kill, and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of judgment. Yeah, amen. Thou shalt not kill. That's what we've been said all along. He says, But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. He said, Don't only not kill, don't be angry. He said, I'm raising it to another level. If you're going to be a follower of me, it's not just about the law, don't kill. It's about don't being angry. He's taking, and you'll You'll see this over and over again. He takes the external, don't kill, and makes it internal, don't be angry. See, Christianity is not an outward thing. It's an inward thing. It's a relationship-based life that is based on a, a, a love for Jesus Christ. And so he takes it there. Look, at, look on in verse number 27. You see the same pattern again. Ye have heard that has been said of them of old, thou shalt not commit adultery. Oh, but I say unto you, that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her. Right, right? So, outward, commit adultery. He said, no, 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 no. Inward. You lust after her. You've committed adultery already. So, the law is important. He's fulfilling the law. He's not putting the law aside. And you'll see that over again and again and again. I won't take time, but you'll see it in verses 31 and 32, 33, 34, 38, 39, 43, 44. That's the pattern of that chapter. Here's what you used to be said, here's what I say. Here's what it used to be, here's what I say. And every time he's upping the game a little bit. So we just can't ignore the law and do whatever we want. There is a ditch of worldliness. There's a ditch of license over here where people think, hey, I'm saved, my sins are forgiven, I can do whatever you want, what I want. 
That's not true. That's not, that's, that's not original Christianity. That's why like Jesus Christ, He's not calling us to that. So here's the question. How do we know when we're getting close to the ditch of hypocrisy? Well, we talked about that last time. If you're uh, all about performance-based and nothing about relationship-based, that's hypocrisy. If you're busy criticizing and being critical of other people and not worried about yourself, that's hypocrisy. He goes over and over these things. How do we know we're getting close to the ditch of worldliness? How do we know? How can we judge? I'm not here to judge you tonight. But would you do yourself the favor of looking at the words of Jesus Christ and judging yourself and asking yourself, am I straying close to the ditch of being a Christian who is living their life too close to the world, a life that is a life of, life of license and not a life of love? All right, so let's look at that. How do we know? A couple of things that were ju just two quick thoughts. Uh, I won't uh, be long tonight. Two quick thoughts here to, to, to think about to see if you're getting close to that ditch. Look at some familiar verses here in Matthew chapter 5. We'll back up a little bit. Verses, verse 13, we'll start there. Very familiar verses. Hope we'll look at them in a little bit different light today. But very good biblical truth. Jesus Christ saying to his disciples for the very first time, Ye are the salt of the earth. But the salt hath lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is henceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and be trodden under the foot of men. Ye, talking about to James and John, I mean all these guys who've just been called from their life of fishing, ye are the light of the world. A city that's set on the hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. One sign that you may be getting close to the ditch of worldliness is this. You're less different than the world. Less different than the world. Christ is saying here, there ought to be a difference between you and other people. I, we're, Jesus Christ walking by the shore, James, John, Andrew, Peter, other guys fishing. You two, follow me. You two, follow me. Let's go. Other guys were left behind. And what Jesus Christ is now sitting there talking to these guys said, okay, you're the light of the world. You're the salt of the earth. You're going to be, if you're going to be following me, you're going to be different than those guys you left behind. There's going to be a distinct difference between you and them. And if we try to blur the lines of what's different and what's not, then we're drifting toward that, that ditch of worldliness. Now, we usually define these things of worldliness as living like the world or being like the world, right? And that's true. We talk about, you know, hey, we don't drink. You know, we don't dance. We're Baptists, you know. That's a, if, you, if you know, even independent Baptists especially, we are known for not drinking and not dancing. Amen. <laughs> And that's and I don't drink or don't dance. No, I, I'm sure I would be a great dancer had that be not be a sin. But I'm sure I would be very good at that. Um, but that's what we. You know, and here's what I get across to you: Wouldn't it be nice to be known? Not we're known for what we don't instead of known for what we do. We don't dance and we don't drink. Well, that's good. I don't think you should dance and I'm not saying you should dance and drink. I'm just saying sometimes we define worldliness by those outward things. Well, I'm not worldly. I don't dance. I don't drink. Listen, it, it, we, we, we get, we, I'm talking about me, we get into these little things where when I was going to Bible college, this is the honest truth, I was going to Bible college. I went to a certain Bible college to look it over to see if I was going to go to Bible college. This is 19, uh, a long time, 1987, 1987, all right? So I'm going to Bible college. Uh, one of the rules at the Bible college I was looking at was you could not have pleats in your pants. That's not a problem today, but back in that day, you got, a lot of the suits that were coming out had like little pleats in the, in the front, like just two little extra folds for whatever reason. That was the style. You weren't allowed to have pleats in your pants because that, they said, was worldly. So, that, I mean, and their definition, and I understand, every college has to draw lines, and, 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 and I'm saying sometimes we get that nitpicky of this is the world, and this is not the world. If you're in style, you're worldly. If you're not, you know, it's, God doesn't call us to be out of style. 
I'm not preaching that you should be in style. I'm just saying that's not worldliness. Here's what worldliness is. Worldliness is an attitude. It's a mindset. It's when the world gets in your head and how you think. When, when the world affects your thinking, your world, you can put a suit on and not wear pleats the rest of your life. All right, God bless you. And never drink and never dance and be so worldly that you're no earthly, good, no good to, to God at all. That's the truth. It's not, it's not about all the outward stuff. It's about here. What's going on in your mind? What's your thinking process like? Are we worldly in the way we think? Here's what the Bible says. Jesus Christ, verse 13, you're the salt of the earth. We're called to be salty. Now, I understand that in our terminology today, the word salty has a different meaning. Salty means cranky, bitter, miserable. So some of you are like, yes, finally, something I could do in this church. I, you can be salty, all right? Salty as in the Bible way, all right? You're not supposed to be cranky or bitter. So if that's who you are, that's not, it's not a good thing. Salty. Ye are the salt of the earth. There, there's a seasoning to you. You're, you're the, you're a different, salt is a difference maker. <laughs> Those of you like, how many like salt? Everybody? Okay, most of you enjoy salt. It's a difference maker. You can make popcorn or you can make popcorn with salt, right? I mean, there's this is, this is a big difference. I, I would not eat popcorn without salt. I need corn on the cob. I got to put salt on corn on the cob. I just have to put butter and salt on corn on the cob. I, it can be very sweet, but I'm putting salt is a difference maker. It, it, it adds the seasoning. And, and God is saying here, you are the salt of the earth. Can I tell you, when you go to your family gathering tomorrow and there's unsaved people there, you're the salt. You're the difference maker. There ought to be a different mindset than everybody else has there. Your thinking's way different. It doesn't mean that, well, I better go and I have to wear a certain article of clothes or, or have my hair cut a certain way so I won't look worse. No, it's not that. It's the mindset. And so go there with the mindset. You are the difference maker. God has called us to be salt. Salt uh, preserves. Uh, salt makes other people thirsty. I mean, there's all kinds of things you can, applications you can talk about salt. But Christ said to these, these men who are following him, for a short time, you're the salt of the earth. But the salt has lost its savor, it's good for nothing. If we, if we stop thinking different than the world and buy into a worldly mindset, we are of no good in the cause of Christ. It doesn't mean, I'm not talking about how you dress. I'm not even talking about, I mean, and I, you can insert any message you want here about music, entertainment, all those things would apply. We ought to be careful on all those things. But I don't think that's the main idea. Christ never mentioned movies here in the whole passage of John. Of the, he never talked about drinking once or dancing. None of those things come up in the Sermon on the Mount. He's talking about, this is your mindset. You, you guys are the light of the world. You're the salt of the earth. You're going to make a difference. I'm, I'm, you're part of me, and I'm going to teach you, and I'm going to send you out and you're going to make a difference in the community that you go to. And we're here together together now, but it's not going to be that way forever. I'm going to send you out and you're going to be the salt of the earth. A preserving influence, a, a, a blessing influence, a, a seasoning influence. You're going to be an influence wherever you go because you have a different mindset. That's what Christ is saying. I mean, this is, this is original Christianity from the, the, the man, the God man who invented it himself. Go out and be different. Go out and have a different mindset. At work, you have a different mindset than everybody else. Because the Bible tells you how to be a good employee. And if you're going to follow Jesus Christ, you read the rest of the Bible, understand how to be a good employee. And you go there trying to be a good employee because you want to be the salt of the earth. It's, it's what you do, not what you don't do, that should make a difference. He not only calls us to be salty in verse 13, but... Verses 14 and 15 and 16, he calls us to be shiny. Let your light so shine before men. Let your light so shine before men. That they may see your dress code. No, it doesn't say that. That they may see your high standards. No, it doesn't say that. That they may see your good works. What are you known for in your office? What are you known for in your family? What are you known for in your neighborhood? Are you the kind person, the loving person? Or are you the person that doesn't do certain things? You see what I'm saying? It's not all about what we don't do. It's what we do. And they see our good works, and that's supposed to bring glory to God. 
Is your life, when someone looks at your life and how you behave yourself at work when things don't go right, or how you handle stress in your life, and how you handle pressure in your life, and how you handle difficult times, do you say, wow, there's something different about that person. I know they worship God. That they're, they, they're, they're a person of faith. They have something real. See, it's what we do and how we handle life that makes us the light of the world. It's not because our standards are higher than everybody else. It's because we have a different mindset than the world. I'm going into the world to be salt. I'm here to help people. I'm going, I'm going into the world to be light, to show them the true light. And really, if you understand the Bible, we're not the light at all. It's just Jesus Christ shining through us. We're not really the salt at all. It's just Jesus Christ coming through us. So as we live Jesus Christ, we become salt and we become light. We are called to be salty. We're called to be shiny. Look at this. Chapter 5, verse 43. Very, this is, these are some of the most challenging verses of Scripture in, the, in, in this Sermon on the Mount for, for me. Ye have heard that it hath been said, verse 43, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thy enemy. Well, that sounds pretty good. Love your neighbor, hate your enemy. I, I can do that. But I say unto you, love your enemies. Do you have any enemies? Bless them that curse you. Have you been cursed? Do good to them that hate you. Does anybody hate you? How could anybody not like you? I mean, come on, you're the nicest people in the world. How could someone not like you? Pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Have you ever been used? Has someone ever used you? I mean, you, and you realize, oh, I, I fell for that. They, they took advantage of me, man. They used me. They, they, oh, that's, I can't believe that a person took advantage of me like that. Have you ever been abused and used like that? Uh, if, if I read the Bible correctly, Christ is saying, that's the old love your neighbor, hate your enemy. I'm saying you love those who, your enemies, and bless them that curse you, and do good to them that hate you, and despitefully use you and persecute you, that ye may be the children of your father. Start acting like your dad. Your dad has changed. <laughs> All the Simmons kids said, Amen. All right. No, Mrs. Simmons is like, Finally, someone said, Don't act. Like, say, Go act like your dad. Not like your old dad. The, your, your old dad was your, the devil. Now, the Heavenly Father, that you can be children of your Father which is in heaven, for he maketh the sun to shine on the evil and on the good. God just gives out good to people, and the sun shines on the good and the bad, and the rain comes on the good and the bad. And it doesn't matter. He doesn't, he doesn't play uh, favorites in those ways. I mean, obviously, God blesses blesses those who are obedient, but he says, God just gives good. God's a good God. He's a good God. He's a good God. God is always good. Always good. Always good. When you're bad, God's good. When you're good, God's good. You know, I hope that your life will become more than just always doing things to try to get God's pleasure. And it can become enjoying a God who already loves you for who you are. Sometimes, you, know, you, know, you ever seen a dog that's been well-trained and, and uh, I mean, just the tone of your voice can change the, 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 the whole attitude of the dog? Good boy, good boy. And then the tag starts wailing, you know, wagging. And then next thing, bad dog. And then all of a sudden, he's like in, in a little, I mean, fetal position. And you say, good dog. I mean, just, you can just play with that dog's emotions over and over again, right? You can do that. If you're a loving, some of you maybe do that. If you're a loving owner, you wouldn't do that. Listen. Christianity is not that. If it becomes that, here's what happens to you. You have a good day, you do, you do pretty good, and you obey the laws of Christ, and you feel like, hey, I did pretty good today. I feel pretty good about myself. I, I feel good. God, you know, I'm, I'm in a good place. And the next day you bomb, you blow it, you mess up, like we all do. And you're like, oh, man, I can't do this. And next day you do good. Oh, I did good, I did good, I did good. God's not up in heaven trying to get you. God loves you when you do good, and God loves you when you do bad. He hates evil, and he's a God who judges evil. I'm not, I'm not trying to put that aside, but God is a God of love. He's a God of good. And here God is saying, act like your father. Love them that hate you. Look at verse 46. For if we love them which love you, if you love them which love you, what reward have ye? Do not even the publicans the same? And if ye salute your brethren only, what do ye more than others? Do not even the publicans so? I, I, I say this, in this passage I call this, we're called to be steady. Just consistent. Love, love, love. 
Kind, kind, kind. Oh, but he despitefully used me, so I'm going to get revenge. No, no, kind. Oh, but he, he hates me. Oh, kind. He's my enemy. Oh, love. Right? Do you understand? That's what he's saying. I mean, I'm, that's how I read it. It's pretty clear. And he said, just be steady and consistent and loving and be like Jesus Christ. And he says there, verse 48, be therefore perfect, complete, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Well, that's pretty strong words. You want, you want to take a passage of Scripture uh, for the next month and try to live it? Take that one. Take that one. And when you go to your family reunion or family gathering tomorrow and, you know, this aunt or that uncle or whatever says something that bothers you and you have a, already have a little rift in your family, use that one for a while. And at work, when that co-worker is trying to dig at you and trying to get you going, you'd use that for a while. I mean, that's, that's, that's real truth that can be applied in our life. Let me tell you about the publicans. It says there in verse 46 uh, and 47, it says, the publicans do that. I mean, the publicans love those who love them and hate those who hate them. So, to do that, you're just like a publican. Now, who, we, said, we said before, don't be like the Pharisees. They're hypocrites. Now he's saying, here's another group, don't be like the publicans. Who are the publicans? Well, publicans were tax collectors, right? And so, here's what the tax, these guys were. They were Jewish men, for the most part, that worked for the Roman government. And they took advantage of people. And here's what they did. They manipulated the system for their own advantage. If it was their advantage to treat someone nice, they treated them nice. If it was their advantage to treat someone mean, they treated them mean. They just worked the system for their own advantage. And so they loved their friends and hated their enemies. And Christ is saying, don't be like that. If you're going to be my follower, don't do the things that just bring advantage to you. Do the things that bring advantage to everybody else. That's what... If it, listen, guys, listen to me. If you're going to be my follower, I mean, I know you left your nets, and left your family, left your father. That's great. But if you're really going to be a follower of me, we're not going to be like the Pharisees and be hypocrites and just go all out on just outward, outward, outward. That's not going to be us. And we're not going to be over here and just do whatever we want and just use every situation to our own advantage. It's not going to be that. We're going to be the salt and the light of the world. Do you understand? We're going to be the difference makers. This, this is go we're going to turn the world upside down here if you'll follow me. This is what it means to be a true follower of Jesus Christ. Don't be like the publicans. Whatever was advantageous for them, they did. But he says, don't be like them. Be like your father. Be like your father. So how do you know if you're maybe sliding to the ditch of willingness? Ask yourself, in my thinking, am I less different than the world? Is, is, my, is my mindset at work just like everybody else's mindset at work? I've got to get through the day. I've got to put my time in. I don't really care. I just got to do it. If that's your mindset, and that's the mindset of everybody else at work, maybe that's not a good mindset. Maybe I'll read the Bible and see what God says about what your mindset ought to be. And if your uh, mindset tomorrow uh, at the family gathering is, I just got to get through this, and if they are nice to me, I'll be nice to them. And if, they're, if they, but if they press the wrong button, I'm going to give it to them. I'm ready. I'm loaded. I'm locked and loaded. Believe me. I'm, I'm not going to start a fight. But I'm not going to back down for one either. You know, you know what I'm saying? I'm, I'm just going to go. And so maybe that's not the right mindset. If we are thinking like the world, I'm talking about more like thinking like the world rather than acting like the world. Because your thoughts will control your actions. And let's be known by our good works, not by what we don't do. Alright, so that's one, one thing we, we got to look at. The second thing I only have two things, so don't worry, it's not very long. Look at Matthew chapter 6. Less different than the world, and I would say this, more distracted by the world. We are drifting toward the ditch of worldliness if we are more distracted by the world. We're going to read through a lengthy passage of Scripture here. We won't go through all of them. I'm just going to read through it. But you'll see, and I'll emphasize the key words as we, as we go through. It's pretty obvious. Verse 25. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat, or what you should drink. I'm sorry, I'm in chapter 6. Why don't you go there? Matthew chapter 6, did I say it? Chapter 6, verse 25. Therefore, I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat, what you shall drink, nor yet for your body what you shall put on. Is not the life more than meat, and the body more than raiment? Behold, the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet their heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? Which of you, by taking thought, 
can add one cubit unto his stature. And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow and they toil, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which is today is, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore, take no thought, saying, What ye shall eat, or what ye shall drink, or withal shall ye be clothed? For all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God, and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take, therefore, no thought for the morrow. For the morrow shall... Take thought for the things of itself, sufficient in the days, the evil thereof. Did you catch that? Take no thought. Take no thought. Take no thought. It says it over and over. Take no thought. Take no thought. What does that mean? It means not to be worried, not to be wrapped up, not to be anxious. Not to, again, it's a mindset. Is your mind constantly working on these things? This is a worldly mindset. If you are distracted by the things of the world and you are your mind's on the wrong type of things, not on the kingdom of God, but on the things of this world, you are slipping toward the ditch of worldliness. You're, your mind is not right. You are distracted by the things of this world. Here are several things that the Bible says. Look at verse 25. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat, or what you shall drink, or your body, what you should put on. Is not life more than meat, and the body more than raiment? I say this. First thing, you can be distracted by culture. Our culture. What you eat, what you drink, your everyday life, and even trying to get all wrapped up in, in having all the nicest things. And our culture is full of materialism. If we're wrapped up in all these things that we have to have, have to have, have to have, that's a worldly mind. That's worse than going to a movie. That's worse than dancing. Like we say, oh, I don't dance, I don't drink, but we're so wrapped up in the things of the world. That's worldliness. Right? Do we understand? That's the mindset we got to watch. We cannot be distracted by the things of this world. Our life is more than Raymond, our life is more than me. Gentlemen, if you're going to be a follower of me, your life means more than just fishing. I'm going to make you fishers of men. And your life means more than just gathering possessions because it's not about that. It's about the kingdom of God. And so if you're going to be a follower of me, it's about these things. And I want to teach you this. I want you to know this. It's more than just that. And if you're taking thought of all these things and you're wrapped up in materialism and the culture of this society, then you are no good to me. You're not walking down the road of the original Christian. Look at verse number 27. Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto his stature? We can be distracted by our culture. We can be distracted by stature. Now here, I mean, obviously it's talking about a physical stature. I mean, and that could, there's application there for sure when we think about things of our appearance and things of our, even our makeup. If I wasn't like this, if I wasn't so emotional, if I wasn't this, if I wasn't so angry, if I wasn't so whatever, if I had, and if I could change those things about myself, honestly, if we're outside ourselves, if we said, make a list of things about yourself that you want to change, we could all change something. And the Bible says if you don't, don't uh, take thought of those things because you can't change those things by just worrying about them. All right, don't be worried about them. But I say to you, in, in, our, in our society, it's more about our stature as in like our status. And this may be more for young people than older people. I mean, even, and nothing wrong with this, but if, you were, if you're all wrapped up, you're worried about how to get more followers on your on social media or likes on your picture or, or getting the approval of other people. Again, we're almost like that, that, uh, that dog is just looking for approval, looking for approval. I always want approval. Oh, so, someone like my picture. Or so, someone, someone say something nice to me. It's not about that. You, you don't need that you have a relationship with Jesus Christ that does not change. Hey, can I tell you something about all you guys? All of you? You're all moody. So am I. Can I tell you who's not moody? Jesus Christ. The same yesterday, today, and forever. He never wakes up in a bad mood. Doesn't get up on the wrong side of the bed. Doesn't have a bad day. He's always the same. And so if we're always trying to go around and get approval from other people and our life is built on approval from other people, we will die sad. Because people, because you can do one thing one day and people will approve and do the same thing the next day and people will disapprove. 
But Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So a worldly mindset is one that worries about your stature and, 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 and measuring up to everybody else's standard and worried about how you measure up and how you measure up. Don't worry about how you measure up to everybody else. How do you measure up to God's word? How do you measure up to Jesus Christ? How do you measure up to God? That's, that's, that's what he's talking about here. Don't be worldly in your mindset. Take no thought of your stature. One more thing. Verse 34. Take therefore no thought for the morrow. For the morrow shall take thought of things of itself. Sufficient day is the evil thereof. We can get distracted by the future. Our culture, our stature, our future. We get so, sometimes so wrapped up in the future of things, we're not even worried about what we're doing today. We're all we're so worried about what's going to happen, how this is going to work out. Uh, is this going to be okay? And, you know, how's this all? and we get so wrapped up and we worry about the future that we can't enjoy today. And God says, sufficient to the day is the evil thereof. Just take care of today and be right today and love God today and serve me today and, and I'll take care of the future. I'm not saying that we don't make plans for the future. I'm not saying that we just ignore the future. I'm saying, God's saying, take no thought of it. Don't, let that, don't get that mindset that you're all, it's all about the future. And wrapped up on what's going to be and not worry about what's going on right now. Live in the present. Live in relationship with Jesus Christ. Look at verse 32. For all these things do the Gentiles seek. All right, we introduced you to several groups. Pharisees, hypocrites, publicans. What's, what's in it for me? What's in it for me? What's in it for me? Here's another group, the Gentiles. Gentiles didn't even know God, had no thought of God. God was even on their... They weren't against God. They didn't even know God. There wasn't even a, a blip on the radar. They had no idea about God at all. And they lived their life like there was no God at all. And God is saying, when you run around trying to get materials and worried about your stature and worried about your future, you're living just like someone who, who says they don't believe in God. Don't act like a Gentile. Don't act like, do you believe in an almighty, all-powerful, all-knowing, all-loving God? Then serve Him and live like it and enjoy life because you have that relationship with God. Verse 33 says this. Here's what our focus should be. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Our focus should be this a spiritual kingdom. Get our mind off the things of the world and get our mind on the things of Jesus Christ. Instead of figuring out, going to work this week, figuring out how can I make an extra buck? How can I get a little bit ahead? How can I get more things? Think about this. How can I be salt? How can I be light? How can I love people who don't love me? How can I, how, can, how in the world can I do good to someone who just used me? How, how do you do that? Jesus Christ told us we can. And I hope to, next time I get to preach, tell you about that road of original Christianity. That I think if we live that lifestyle, allows us to do those types of things. I believe that all of us would say that we want to live that path of original Christianity and be an authentic Christian. If we overemphasize the law, the rules, the standards, the outward, the, all those things, we go toward the ditch of hypocrisy. If we say, oh, I can do whatever I want and just live however I want, I'm just going to go like the Gentiles and like the publicans and whatever's good for me, as long as I can manipulate the situation to my advantage, I'm going to keep doing that and I'll get all that I can and, and, I'm, and I, you know, I'll come to church on Sunday and I'll, I'll put God over here, but this is really my mindset, then we're worldly. Instead of fo focusing in on being the salt, and the light and the love of God every day, everywhere we go. Are we less different than the world and more distracted by the world? Worried about the culture, our stature, and our future? If we are, we're slipping off the road into the ditch of willingness. That's not a very fun place for a Christian to live. There is a wonderful life of serving Jesus Christ. And we ruin that because we get a mindset that's of, not of this kingdom of God. It's of the kingdom of the world. Would you bow your head and close your eyes, please? We trust you've enjoyed this message preached at the Bible Baptist Church of St. Thomas, Ontario, pastored by Dr. Al Stone. We invite you to be a part of our worship service this Sunday.